Yeah, just go right through the big beautiful quinoas. Yeah, I think the, the quinoa are incredible. And then the amaranths. I mean, look at all these colors of amaranth. So when you rough up a seed amaranth, it's going to just drop so many seeds. And then you can blow those little flowers away and have just a handful of beautiful amaranth seed that appears to have all your amino acids except for lysine. And so as far as part of a nutritional profile, Again, really honoring those indigenous cultures mm -hmm. of Mesoamerica and South America who since time immemorial have been in relationship with amaranths, with quinoas, and that collaboration and honoring of beauty, whether it's the, the amaranths, the quinoas, the corns, the sunflowers, these crops that come from the so-called Americas. <laughs> Take those sunflowers on here. These gardens are the sixth oldest certified organic farm in California at this point, and going on, geez, almost 50 years of organic farming, hand-tilled, never mechanically tilled, biodiverse, seed-saving. This plant, seed amaranths, grain amaranths, although when they're young and small, as a little baby plant like that, comes up as a seedling. So if you let your plants that are edible go to seed, your seed bank in your soil becomes loaded with edible plants. And we get incredible flushes of these edible amaranths. So you can pop them like that and then eat them raw or stir fry them when they're a little bit bigger. Or we'll let these plants that they selected, they're gonna go all the way to seed and then you get the seed and you get all the wonderful things out of amaranth seed. So these are amazing amaranth greens. And they come up on their own. We're just creating conditions conducive for amaranth to be self-seeding. And it's an annual plant in any one year, but it's a perennial expression in our gardens. So annuals and perennials, right? So the life cycle of the plant is annual from seed to seed but its presence in the system is perennial, which is different than a full woody perennial like a fruit tree or an oak tree. This is my favorite fruit right now. This little guy is called a Shapova, and it's a hybrid, a French hybrid, between a mountain ash, a sorbus, and a pear, a pyrus. It's a sorbo-pyrus hybrid called Shapova. Oh, forget about it. Seriously, people. That is the sweetest thing. I'm part of the community that owns this 80 acre property. It was seven of us who bought it back in 1994. It's the community kitchen, dining room. Everybody eats meals together here all the time. Worm bins, composting facilities, pears from the planted in the 1890s. And it's a consensus-based residential collective of folks who all live on site and have raised families on site and kids and what's up, Adam? Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Good. How's it? This property, thankfully, we inherited and are standing on the shoulders of obviously the big shoulders we're standing on is that we are in the traditional homeland of the Southern Pomo and the Coast Miwok people, and we work with those tribes. And then in the 70s, a group called the Farallons Institute had a rural center here. And one of the things we inherited from the Farallons is small structures. And so the primary residences here are all in the 700 to 900 square foot range. Again, this place was the Farallons Institute in the 70s. And a, the state architect of California at the time was a man named Sim Vanderen, and he was one of the co-founders of this place. There was an Office of Appropriate Technology, and so the state funded the construction of a series of passive solar heated and cooled tiny houses. They were 300 square feet a piece back in 76, 77. They had different techniques and strategies to heat and cool them with different strategies of ponds on roofs and little flat plate collectors and little greenhouse structures and rock basins underneath, foundations, and all this kind of stuff. And so this little cluster of homes here of five with these rounded roofs 
were originally what was called solar suburbia. So the idea of the rounded roof was it their sense that that curvature would facilitate this idea of, of air movement, of hot air rising, cooling, and sinking, basically like a convection current. And in this case, there is a little passive solar upstairs little unit, like a baseball cap. It has a little brim on it, so it keeps the face shaded in the sun when it's high, but it lets the sun onto the face of the building in the winter. Were these successful? You said it was an experiment, you know, in passive solar. What did it work? I think what they really learned is you site the building south, you optimize that east-west length, and then you figure out how much glazing you have on the front to let sunlight and, and energy, thermal energy, in or out based on the height of the wall and the, the length of the eave. And then what kind of thermal mass of the floor or inside the building is there to absorb that radiant heat. Probably the rounded roof thing when all was said and done didn't so add to the performance of the building that other issues around how to roof those things. <laughs> but it looks cool. And it may not be not good, but you don't have to do that, I don't think. These homes have all been subsequently remodeled and expanded, and it's one of the primary areas where the residential community lives. And then it's planted in a matrix here, primarily of a perennial polyculture. So pineapple guavas, figs, Oranges, plums, pears, apples, citrus, carob, olives, crab apples. Yep, I'm gonna get a nice crop of figs. Or these thornless prickly pears. These pads that don't have thorns. So this is another hybrid of a long traditional crop. So you can eat the nopales or you can get the fruit called tunas when they're ripe. These aren't ripe yet. It's a classic food forest. Here's a denizen of the land. What's up, David? These Asian pears are up. Oh. Amazing. Hi. Hi. I love this too. <laughs> and Bill Mollison, the founder of Permaculture, used to come here quite a lot all through the 70s and 80s. So the property has a long history over nearly 50 years now of being involved in the sustainable, alternative, appropriate technology, organic gardening, biointensive, quote, now permaculture. Okay. How's it going? Good. Good, good. Intentional community. I don't know who's coming for dinner, so we're trying to get this together. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, if you could let me know. People might refer to us now as an eco-village. Mm -hmm. That lingo wasn't, back in 94, wasn't really in vogue like it is now. You seem to have a good yields here. It's not only uh, conceptually attractive, but uh, you, you have a result here. It's not, it, it works. It works because the folks from the early 70s on up now really dedicated themselves to what, 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 what is grown here year after year. What is most perennial here is soil. Soil is what's being grown here. So this garden apparently back in the 70s was completely compacted and denuded and the topsoil was eroded away because of animal impact. And they started in with hand tillage deep cultivation, the addition of organic matter, of life, of plants, and continuing to build soil so that the soil fertility, the structure, the tilth of the soil, the water holding capacity, the organic matter, it's a living system. Soil is a living ecosystem. It's not dead dirt. Biointensive is a gardening technique and it's most known for a soil building methodology called double digging. That allows you to very rapidly, with a lot of input and energy, so it's a lot of work, but if you really need to take soil that's dead now and you're going to willing to put the energy in to get it going and loft it up and loosen it up and add organic matter because you need to grow food now, it's a pretty incredible technique. The gardens here are not double dug anymore. They haven't been since the late 70s but they get single dug or tilth. They're managed differently depending on the crops. The idea that industrial agriculture believes that it should guarantee that soil becomes dead dirt by spraying it with methyl bromide, killing everything, and then artificially subsidizing your crop with ammonia nitrate, which was invented as a material, as an explosive in World War I, right? and to literally kill your soil 
so that you have a quote high yielding single monocrop of a plant that has been genetically engineered and is patented for a corporation is entirely antithetical to everything we're about. <laughs> That's our 15 minute bell for lunch, y'all. Oh, oh my gosh, we're almost done. Okay. Oh, so we're gonna finish the bell So we're all about life, not death. So these are our, our guest houses for when students come for a workshop or a training. This plaster is a lime-based plaster. So instead of a straight stucco where you use the Portland cement and the whole process of basically for every pound of Portland cement, there's three pounds of CO2 that has to get cooked out of that calcium, that limestone. If you're going just to lime, then making a plaster out of that is a lower embodied energy on the front end and then to some degree, it actually recalcifies by absorbing atmospheric CO2 and actually gets more durable over time because it's part way. So there's reclaimed redwood. And then what's fun is actually all the, the building doors. And if we step inside, all of the trim, all of the wainscoting, all of the materials that we build the desks. Uh, a wonderful Japanese farmer in his late 80s in Petaluma they made their chicken coops out of old growth redwood back in the day and they're now mostly falling down so he donated his whole chicken coop to us and we spent several weeks with our crew disassembling it and replaning it and cleaning it up so pretty much all the interior trim is from reclaimed chicken coop that was built from the 1920s all of the sink water and the shower water all goes into on-site gray water systems so it's plumbed with a two-way valve that allows us to direct it to the landscape and we do the traditional system where it's a mulch basin system out into our edible food forest. And then in this case actually where it says toilet, this toilet here is a compost toilet and so it's a bit of a advanced version. So it has three ounces of water in this and it's a vacuum flush toilet because where the unit is is in the opposite side of the building and so to convey the material over there. And we have a formal permit with the County of Sonoma, with the County Health Department and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. To, and we've had one round of tests so far and they've come actually really clean. And so it's, we were able to take a combined number ones and twos in a compost system and render it pathogen free and then be able to get at the carbon nitrogen compost again, which reutilizing in a forest based system as a mulch. The landscapes around the building, we do all native landscaping in this area. So these are all California native plants, really drought resilient, which is important this year in, in the drought. And we move through the natives and we eventually go into the garden of things that aren't so native. So we were just looking at the front end of the compost toilet and we have what we call our G and G criteria, which is we want to please grandma on the front end and we want to please government on the back end. <laughs> so down here is where the business end of that toilet is of once you make your contribution so we can study it scientifically, it ends up in this model here. We're actually studying three different models that are available commercially. And this one is called the Phoenix. The material comes into the top there was some organic matter that's put in here in the beginning and then that material that went through a masticator grinder is deposited on the surface and then the biology in here eventually renders it composts it through a thermophilic biological based aerobic with oxygen based compost and the finished material when it's done we're able to harvest out of the bottom we have the phoenix system we have a clivus multrum system and we have one that's called the eco carousel from sweden in another building so we're doing a comparative test. Here's actually where the gray water system goes. So this is a classic three-way valve. And right now it goes to this direction. And when someone uses either the shower or the bathroom sink up there, we're gonna divert that water through this small pipe and we take it out into a mulch basin in the landscape and are able to irrigate it on site in a gravity-based way without electricity. Obviously there's compost toilets that are just simple. Someone hand cranks it at home. I mean, why <clears throat> all this? This is a commercial building, so it's lots and lots of people coming through. So we've got a higher volume system here. So when you see this system, you're not thinking to yourself, 
well, wait a minute, that's bigger than what I need for my private family home. This is the next level up. The fun part is, is that the biology works the same. There's just different technologies that you can achieve that goal at different scales. Mm -hmm. What we're really trying to prove here is that we actually trust biology and we believe that a system that is based in biology with oxygen can render a toxic waste, if you will, of human waste into a resource. That's right, the average American wastes 20 gallons a day, courtesy flushing their ones and twos. And that's on top of the energy, water, and chemicals it takes to pump and treat those dumps so they can be safely expelled. Nature has a poop loop. And so we really don't like the word waste a lot in permaculture. Waste water to us is, we're not wasting water, it's resource water, gray water systems, storm water systems, recharge, roof water systems, harvesting, or on the solid waste side of things. Can we, instead of making it go away by flushing it away, can we actually harvest it, clean it up, recycle it, and reutilize it for the benefit of the, of the fecundity and resiliency of the system? And actually, in this case, have a system that increases the life in the soil food web, which grows plants, which sequester carbon. All of the water indoors, the quote gray water indoors, is going again out to gray water systems to irrigate the landscape. And any water that's raining on the roofs and coming off the gutters or the landscape is going into these swale structures. So you can see there's a big berm right here that happens to have blueberries on it. And there's a basin on the uphill side of that berm. And so when sheet flow of stormwater comes down or we direct the downspouts, we infiltrate that on contour. So we slow it, spread it, sink it, store it, and share it. And we do it in situ as an irrigation for blueberries, or then it overflows to here for thornless blackberries. This swale overflows around there to gooseberries or to currants. And eventually, when we get rain, big years, it ultimately goes to a habitat pond that is above the garden. All of the irrigation for the entire farm comes from that pond. The Farallons folks I keep mentioning excavated out a really large pond that's sealed naturally with the clays that are native and it fills up when a good winter comes with just runoff from a meadow and then we use that and we actually gravity irrigate the whole operation. And we fill that water up as a groundwater recharge structure, but in our case holds water long enough that it actually breeds our native tree frogs here. And those frogs go into our gardens and can eat their weight in insects on a daily basis as our biological pest control. And a few snakes get to eat a frog and a hawk gets to eat a frog. So we're creating complex ecological systems that are probiotic. We're pro-life of all species of all generations for all time. <laughs> We're not antibiotic. Antibiotics is when you're against life and you live on the only planet in the known universe that has life, kind of a party foul. So we're probiotic, permies here. We're creating conditions conducive for life here, including humans. Yeah, so in the gardens here, and we pass through kind of our multi-layered, stacked, perennial polyculture food forests and where we had like the olives and we had apples and pears and peaches and plums and mulberries and figs and, and all of those fruits. And now we're stepping down into a specific area of high intensity that's primarily an annual uh, production garden where we've got raised beds, again, double dug beds originally back in 1974, no longer. Again, this is a, a seed saving garden here as well. And so some of our beds may have a designated end called a bed end where a specific plant we're growing on behalf of saving seed or for propagation. And then further down the bed, then we'll be growing production. And a lot of times we're not digging beds anymore, so sometimes it's no-till. Here they just weeded the garden and laid the material like a mulch right on top. And we're doing sheet composting in situ, right on the bed. And they'll just open this up and plant into that as a no-till operation. Some crops need a little bit of lofting and a little bit of slight tillage, so that happens there too. We're not really wedded to techniques per se. We're interested in performance criteria. Working with cultivars and, and plants 
that are more suited and adapted to the microclimate of your place so that they're healthier, which means you don't need to fight pests or do too much extra work or think about having to spray something. This is the, where the gardeners are. Within their office space is then the Kent Whaley Memorial Seed Collection. So inside here is a climate controlled seed storage. This is the work of Doug Gosling. What's really cool about what Doug O does is the diversity of seeds. All the jars and bins are labeled in such a way where they're done by the plant family. So things in the cucurbitaceae, the melons, the gourds, the cucumbers, the watermelons, you know, those things are botanically arranged. So then the solanaceae, where the tomatoes or the peppers or the eggplants, the brassicaceae, which is the collards, the cauliflowers, the cabbages, the broccolis, the, and then within, within any one of those Brussels sprouts, there may be multiple seeds of different varieties. Doug is part of a global community of people who save seeds and trade seeds and share seeds, and, and he has a wonderful nursery. So, so the idea of seed saving is we can't just rely on the stuff that's sold commercially in stores. Yeah, I think people all over the planet over time who have were agrarian place-based peoples were in relationship with the plants that they were cultivating and collaborating with. And over time, as the food system has become corporatized and industrialized in sort of a green revolution, really point past 1950s era, the wealth and the diversity of genetics has been whittled down because the gene pool has been narrowed down because of a consolidation in a corporate scenario. And then many of those crops were then hybridized and patented and such that you don't have access to the genetics unless you buy it from this corporation. And then they put in a Terminator technology with a genetic engineering piece. So now you're on the hook to them. And that's just not a recipe for resiliency and community security. And so the global world of seed savers are pushing back against that trend and are saying actually no, and really honor these, these are living beings. These are organisms and we are in relationship with them. Been a bit of a rough year for these gluots. Oh. As we move through the property, there's a lot of what in ecology we call ecotones or edges. And so we really work with the edges in the layout of various elements in the system. And so as we move through the garden where there's a lot of say production annual beds, it steps up into herbaceous borders and then it goes through a threshold of a gate. And in this case into say this apple orchard, pink pearl, one of the great apples of the 40 kinds of apples we have here and then right into native oak woodland. And then it'll drop back down and we may end up having more production or there's a building and a landscape. And so really creating a mosaic of connectivity and microclimates and diversity is a process that we really think about a lot. One of the things we're doing is that as people are paying attention, the West right now in California is in significant both drought and many years here recently, uh, significant huge fires. And so we do a lot of work in our wildlands around managing the forest in a situation where a hundred years ago plus every tree was cut. Our forests have been cut three times and now it's a bit of a fuel load mess. So we work on forest health and management with a mantra of fewer trees and more forest. And we're trying to head back to old growth again through our processes and limb and thin and create a fire resilient substructure. But in areas like here where we're close to buildings with steep slopes, this is what's called defensible space. And in this case, what we did is a little bit of thinning and limbing for fire ladders in a native oak and bay forest. And then we actually have a little paddock here and we run goats and sheep because we have a small home flock of goats and sheep. So this is a grazing paddock so we can feed our goats and sheep that are stacking functions by also reducing fuel load and maintaining a fire break as defensible space within the 100 foot zone of say a building on behalf of the structure protection kind of a deal. Since the first week that I moved on the property in 1994, I started limbing dug fir trees for fire ladders because had been doing that work before. So 
We've never not stopped doing land management and fuel load mitigation. Say we might limb up the dead branches and the green limbs and we might thin, so fewer trees, more forest, and the overstock smaller trees that are not so healthy and more flammable. That material, again, is not a waste that needs to be thrown away and taken away. We see it as a resource. And so we'll sometimes place it in a gully that's eroding as a brush plug to stuff a gully to mitigate erosion that actually holds more water on the land and improves forest health and takes a problem of fire and turns it into earth and water. And the more we thin and limb the forest, the better the owls can hunt. So we're creating spotted owl habitat through fuel load mitigation while taking the waste product and creating habitat for the food source for the owl all in one fell swoop, shall we say. So integrated relational solutions is really key. That means somebody's not happy. Oh. And we hope it's not us. Oh. This addition yeah. off the rounded roof there is the first permitted light straw clay building in California. So it's got light straw clay walls, earthen plasters, interior and exterior, lime-based exterior. And that is a fire plane. That's the spotter plane, which means that siren we heard, that means that plane just came from Santa Rosa and is headed that way to do the prelim on the possibility that there's a fire. That's a plane you don't want to see right now. What are you chickens doing? It's hot, you guys are in the shade, huh? Oh, hi chickies. Here, I'll get you guys some food. This little vine is just kind of a menace. But they have them some little faux tea vine. See, look at them. They love it so much. Oh, they want salad. They love their salad. All right, chickies. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Want some salad? Chickens are part of our composting system. So down in the main big kitchen, we have different kinds of compost buckets. And one of those buckets are fresh greens and things or rinds that either are going to go to the chickens or are gonna to go to the sheep and goats. And other compost is going to compost piles and other compost is going to worm bins. So there's a whole integrated uh, carbon nutrient management system. And so the chickens are, besides the eggs we get every day, obviously there's them in relationship. And then we do also have a few little ducks still hanging around. Folks get caught up in the details and they think they have a recipe that's universally applicable and we don't resonate with that. These guys are wonderful. Some people call them golden berries or ground cherries. It comes in its own organic eco wrapping paper. <laughs> you just pop that open, <laughs> pop that in, and toss. Difficult to plant and take care of? No. Look, it's just here. We don't even irrigate it. It just grows. So we designed taking our cues from what is the genius of nature that has been in that place for eons and eons and eons. It has evolved and adapted to the conditions. Here in the gardeners again are showcasing plants that have a long history with peoples of the Americas. So things like amaranths or the quinoas, corns, sunflowers, tomatoes. Here the seed saving and the gardens and the collections are doing their darndest to really honor the legacy and relationship of peoples who have their origin story and connection. Not just had but have. It's this idea of a worldview that's kin-centric. It's really about relations with or as a wonderful man Onondaga faith keeper elder Orrin Lyons would say what you people meaning white settler colonists, what you people call resources, our people call relatives. And so what is that opportunity to be humble enough to be in communion again in a collaborative way with, with all of life instead of a domineering manner and, and honoring that? So when we get into our definition of permaculture, which is really a, a a design methodology for regenerative human settlements. Actually, the most permacultural thing we do here is intentional community. It's about how groups of people get together and figure out how to get along with each other to 
have a quote permanent or durable culture. You know, oh my God, this food looks amazing. Wow. Who made it?